Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Tomaselli. I'm a third year doctoral candidate at Point Park University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, thank you for being a part of my paper presentation here today. Um, this work stems from my doctoral dissertation proposal uh, that's been cultivated in large part and largely co-authored uh, by my dissertation chair, Matt Allen. So um, again, thank you for your time. And I, I wanted to let you know here that I've made a slide deck available. So as we go through here, I'll let you know what slide I'm working from just to give you an idea of pacing and give us some structure. Uh, and also, um, you don't have to stare at my mug here the whole time. So with that said, uh, moving on to slide one. So the title of my, my paper is Boundary Management Theory and the Neoliberal Worker's Aspiration to Pathological Subjectivity. Slide two, uh, this is the first slide of the introduction. So boundary management theory. Boundary management theory considers flexibility and permeability of role identities in work and non-work context. And so what this means is oh, uh, uh, taking up a work role is a highly permeable role in that it demands a lot of us. So you see there below on the slide, segmenters versus integrators. This is really the dynamic or the dialectic that's set up within boundary management theory. People who are integrators don't have uh, much difficulty adopting a uh, work role or a non-work role in a variety of contexts. They have more flexibility, whereas segmenters tend to experience emotional distress or have more of a difficult time, particularly when they perceive themselves as having to take up or failing to take up a um, work role in a non-work context. And so this is what really lie at the heart of boundary management theory. And what we see is psychologists studying boundary management theory, they draw a distinction between boundary preference and boundary enactment. Insofar as misalignment between the two uh, is correlated quantitatively uh, to a statistically significant degree with emotional distress. And so what lie at the core of this, as I think we'll see uh, shortly, is segmenters have difficulty enacting work roles in non-work context or vice versa they have difficulty taking up what they see as a non-work role when a non-work context actually becomes a work context and this undermines their ability to uh, detach psychologically or experience psychological detachment um, which ultimately leads to emotional distress so what uh, psychologists studying boundary management theory ultimately lobby for and what they ultimately suggest is preference enactment alignment wherever possible. So if there's an employee who prefers segmentation, well, they ought to be paired with a uh, employer who's willing to um, allow them to segment. But what's interesting is in the background, they're always sort of quietly uh, tipping their hand in making the employee responsible for being more mindful and regulating emotionally um, in order to minimize the impact of not being able to, to create an alignment between preference and enactment. So a lot of the responsibility very slowly starts to rest with, um, and, and very quietly starts to rest with the employee. But what's interesting throughout, again, and this is why I say they sort of quietly recommend this or quietly tip their hand, is that there is a very implicit moral dimension to boundary management theory, uh, boundary management theory study. And the integrator is set up as the aspirational way. Like, if you were good enough, this is how you would be. You would be an integrator, and this would eliminate a lot of these problems. So again, what we find is in the sort of quiet mentions of, oh, maybe they should become more mindful or regulate emotionally, is really a disregard for context and who I can be within context and that responsibility for boundary crafting and emotional regulation ultimately kind of falls to the employee within this dynamic. And I mean, there are some authors who do attend to uh, uh, potentially shifting responsibility, but it's few and far between based on everything I've read. So moving on to slide three here, what I'm doing and, and what I'm arguing is that from a psychoanalytic and a postmodern philosophical perspective, I think we can actually look at the entire segmentation integration continuum as possibly iatrogenic and the idea that we can preference pair um, is actually quite self undermining or asking us to disregard context altogether. So there is an element of denying self and that if we're accommodating segmentation, this can be seen as pathological to the extent that it perpetuates a primitive defensive structure that we'll see shortly is associated with a narcissistic characterology. 
And by the same token, we might think of maximal integration as denying context, right? So it demonstrates a disregard for a teleologically situated contextual experience um, and kind of demands context negation via what we might think of as a, as a more psychotic uh, process in omniscient control. So what I'm really trying to do here throughout the course of this presentation is deconstruct the segmenter's emotional distress via relational psychoanalytic and postmodern philosophical thought to highlight the overdeterminedness, or what I'll call on the slide here, a double whammy of intrapsychic processes as well as what's actually emerging uh, in the environmental context and the sociocultural values that uh, undergird the development of uh, narcissistic processes as well as the fact that there's a discrepancy um, in what we actually experience. So society will tell us, well, you should be instrumental, you should be autonomous, you should be atomistic, and it's really your responsibility. Meanwhile, we find in the sense of this pervasive power imbalance that these structures and these institutions um, ultimately really don't afford us a lot of these things. And so we have this felt sense of a dominating interdependence and vulnerability that these structures um, help to create uh, that sense within the employee, but also push that aside and say, no, 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 this isn't what's happening. This is how you should be. So what I'm interested in is sort of defraying or properly assigning responsibility for um, addressing the segmenter's emotional distress by ultimately illuminating, yeah, there's an ontological relationality and interdependence that we really can't avoid, but yet neoliberal thought and neoliberal uh, norms and values um, constantly uh, undermine and say, no, 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 we're actually independent. We're actually atomistic. We're actually in a vacuum. As well, you know, it, I would also like this work to be put toward operationalizing a body of quantitative data in support of um, relational psychoanalytic psych psychotherapy and providing an evidentiary basis for that, if we can operationalize the same. Moving on to the fourth slide here, I think um, the questions that emerge are the following, as you would see here. So I think the first one is who can or can't I be here? And I think that's what boundary management theory really speaks to. And I think they do a good job of that. At least it highlights a phenomena, right? But I think where it doesn't go far enough is situating this I, right? It doesn't talk about who is or isn't the I, who is or isn't the neoliberal subject or the neoliberal employee coming into the situation and how they might interpret um, the demands placed on them in the workplace or even perceived demands placed on them in the workplace. So to that end, another question that I don't think they go far enough in asking that maybe psychoanalysis and, and postmodern philosophy does is what are the unformulated psychodynamics that percolate to address who I can or can't be here, right? Um, next question is where do, those, where do those dynamics come from? So where can we, to where can we trace sociocultural developmental ground for the eye psychodynamics? And then what's at the core of this emotional distress? So they said, yeah, there is emotional distress, but we don't know anything about it. We don't know anything about it from the standpoint of boundary management theory. It's just, it's there and it needs to be eliminated. You know, we don't have too much interest in exploring what lay, what lay at the heart of that. Um, and then finally, so when I talk in terms of the employees or the segment, there's more specifically emotional distress being overdetermined, we're talking about Yes, not only is there intrapsychic psychodynamics occurring, but there's an, actually an interpersonal engagement with structures and systems and institutions that really um, reinforce the idea of who I can or can't be here. To illuminate I's felt experience of vulnerable relational interdependence, despite explicit neoliberal uh, narratives around atomism, balanced instrumentality, and individual responsibility. So even though we're being told this is the way things are, we have a very different experience, and I think we can actually point to external evidence in the world that would, uh, that would say the same, that would say that there's a reason um, that we would be experiencing the world this way, and it's not purely a matter of projection in psychoanalytic terms. Okay, so moving on to slide five, highlighting the question and really taking a moment here with boundary management theory. Who can or can't I be here? And again, I think boundary management theory does a, a fairly decent job of um, at least alerting us to the phenomenon of emotional distress of the segmenter uh, in the face of misalignment of preference and enactment and, and what that does to the psyche. Um, okay, so moving on to slide six, jumping into that. So boundary theory posits that people do arrange boundaries and possible ways of being with respect to where, when, and how 
they enact certain contextually linked role identities. And admittedly, uh, actually boundary management theorists do kind of tip their cap to the fact that how one enacts a role identity does depend on sociocultural values, beliefs, and norms relative to a particular role identity, and that this operates in dialogue with an individual's own experiences, values, motivations. Um, to this end, Ashforth et al., as the progenitors of a boundary theory, frame the distress associated with role transitions or boundary crossings in terms of the type and degree of the contrast and conflict that emerges between our contextually linked roles. Um, and the higher the level of effective chafing associated with the transition, the greater one's experience of emotional distress within this framework. So slide seven. So to manage the distress, as we know, and, and I think psychoanalysis would, put, would, uh, would tip its cat to this as well, um, people live out strategic schemas along a continuum that, uh, that keeps anxiety at bay, right? And so what we're talking about here is, at least within the framework of boundary management theory, is some people have preferences for high levels of integrating role identities across boundaries. So what this means is they are very flexible with respect to the hats they can wear and, and, and in fact, where they can enact them. And it's not, there isn't much effective chafing for folks of this nature. Um, on the flip side of that continuum, we have the segmenter who actually does struggle with flexibility particularly, as we'll see here shortly, is when a non-work context in one's home suddenly becomes a work context with thoughts of work, um, and then I can't be non-work me here now. So who can't I be here? I can't be non-work me in a work setting. So while the idea of actually mending this preference enactment discrepancy by aligning individual and organizational boundary preferences is prevalent in the boundary theory and boundary management literature, uh, I want to point this out. There are really only two studies I've encountered that actually test the relationship between a consciously or unconsciously perceived value clash in an employee's inability to psychologically detach from work or their emergent emotional distress when these contexts switch and I, you know, we start to experience the question of who can or can't I be here. Moving on to slide eight. So given technological advancements, globalization, intensifying corporate demands on employees, um, which started to emerge primarily in the economic recession of the late 2000s, uh, boundary management theory has really come to the fore um, as a way of thinking about and addressing emotional distress associated with the value conflict between preference and enactment as work more and more uh, extends into non-work domains. And what we see here and what I mentioned at the top was that emergent data and boundary management theorists, they favor value alignment between employees and employers segmentation and integration preferences to facilitate this psychological detachment. So like, um, we're going to avoid you even thinking about work here because if you do, it's going to undermine your productivity. Um, so again, data favors value alignment between uh, segmentation and integration prefer preferences, i.e., minimizing work-related thoughts on non-work time and alleviating emotional distress insofar as one perceives um, their employing organizations' norms and values as demanding their performance in these settings. Um, and ultimately, the idea for a lot of boundary management theorists is that, well, insofar as we can align preference, it's going to diminish emotional conflict, it's going to diminish conflict, and uh, thus emerge emotional distress, and we'll be, we'll be happy folks. Slide nine. So um, the articles, some of the uh, above mentioned articles that, that I mentioned here suggest that actually work and non-work integration, and I don't think this would come as a surprise to any of us, is the order of the day for contemporary workers in our march toward technological advancement and profit maximization. But what's interesting is um, these a, a lot of these studies acknowledge that uh, integration is the ideal, but a lot of people's preferences are for segmentation. So um, in keeping with quietly voiced norms, these studies point to the employees need to take up individualistic countermeasures um, to address that rising tide of integration. It's not that the employer has to do something or we need to change this as a system or a society. It's that you need to get better at mindfulness. You need to get better at emotion regulation because this isn't going away. 
right? So the uh, the thinking there is that um, we're let, let's uh, enable employees to willfully shift between work and non-work roles in a way that aims to negate contextual awareness um, of the self that emerges and minimize that effective chafing when non-work domains are contaminated with work thoughts. Let's just better to remove it than explore it, right? So calling attention uh, to that tension between viability and impossibility of actually enacting a segmentation preference, um, you know, against this pervasive acontextualizing due to market pressures. Uh, boundary management theorists like Rothbard and Olier Malter, they articulate there's a quiet moral dimension in boundary theory, segmentation, integration continuum. And they call out the prevailing attitude that work and non-work segmentation, it's fading, such that uh, boundaries have to be drawn increasingly in cognitive and emotional terms. So again, foreshadowing here a little bit, you kind of have to demonstrate a, some level of omnipotent control akin to uh, a psychotic process in order to uh, not feel badly here. And so moreover, Rothbard and Olier Malaterre overtly criticize one of the few within boundary management theory. This is the only I could find. Uh, they overtly criticize boundary management theory's failure to question its own teleological embeddedness, its own lens that lay implicit within North American values of self-reliance, autonomy, freedom, and personal growth. This is what we fail to illuminate as this is what is the good. It ignores that and just assumes that it's good. So that's some of what I'm trying to do here that Rothbard and Olier uh, Malaterre ha have already engaged. So in doing so, they actually illuminate what they identify as boundary management literature's overemphasis on boundary preference as an individual choice. So they ign um, ignoring this choice is actually being contextually situated within larger frameworks, within the family, the workplace, societal systems, so that all of a sudden, you know, this thing that we're, we ought to feel shame about for not being able to uh, pony up is not so much uh, an individual choice or we have the freedom to um, explore as much as we might think. Okay, slide 10. So researchers identify psychological detachment as a good way to foster recovery from work-oriented stressors and, and uh, sustain well-being. And, and as such, value alignment emerges relative to this um, psycho psychological detachment is good insofar as researchers argue for those with low flexibility relative to high variability employment, which we would frame as the segmenter or someone with a segmentation preference. So what's good for them? Maximizing psychological detachment to minimize emotional distress, as I mentioned before. But what's interesting, and I think it's worth pointing out, is that um, the instruments that actually measure uh, one's capacity uh, for uh, preference, they skew toward a segmentation preference. So there's some assumptions inherent here as well. And also a study by Weffer et al. Um, that actually compared integration enactment practice with segmentation enacted pra practice demonstrated via self-report that those who enacted integration um, are those who tended to experience emotional distress were more exhausted given less opportunities for recovery. So I think what we can extrapolate from this um, in, in a study I'm about to study here in a second is that you know there's an inference that exhausted employees enacting integration were at odds with their segmentation leaning preference despite actually having behaved in line with integration and to this end um, what, what I think is an excellent study by Focrio et al found quote a positive and unexpected unexpected link between preference for segmentation and emotional exhaustion and they attributed this correctly in my mind with uh, integration becoming the order of the day as new technologies, globalization, increasing schedule flexibility, maybe putting forward a societal model of work-life integration. What does this mean? In short, more people in these studies tend to prefer segment, seem to prefer segmentation. I'll take a step back. And the, uh, and the data actually suggests that the tension between a discrepancy between segmentation preference and actual integration enactment does play a role in emotional distress in the workplace. So to this end, I think um, boundary management theory does a good job of, of, of illuminating that piece of that there is a phenomenon that I can't be this I in this place here, right? Okay, so slide 11. Uh, I want to highlight some of the questions that I foreshadowed before. I don't think boundary management does a great job of, of considering, or at least doesn't explore it in the depth that 
I think would be helpful. So some of the questions I'm gonna address here in order, again, this slide 11, is who is or isn't this I? Who is the I that struggles um, with being a certain me in a certain situation that's contextually linked? So who is the I that's struggling? What is the subjectivity? Where can we trace its psychodynamics, right? In, in terms of sociocultural norms, values, et cetera. And, and as we'll see shortly, even in developmental grounding in highly power imbalanced relationships with child and caregiver um, linked to attachment data. And then what are these unformulated psychodynamics that percolate to address who I can or can't be here? So we have this I, who's the subject, where does it come from and how does it work? And that's what I'm hoping to answer here. So slide 12, moving on. So commentators associated with relational psychoanalysis and uh, postmodern philosophy address subjectivity or what Richardson et al. describe as the experience of being a self. And what a self is for, for, for these folks is a, and for me, quite honestly, uh, is a situated phenomenon where human beings structure and interpret their experiences according to available cultural meanings of where and when exist. Right. So um, this situated self experience is integrated and negotiated in terms of a culture's overarching value system and dictates uh, really a model for ideal being for a particular place and time. Bear with me one second here as I check in on our time. Okay, uh, so Cushman, Hoggett, and Leighton respectively frame contemporary subjectivity through the lens of neoliberal ideals. So what self does neoliberal, uh, do neoliberal ideals imbue, right? Such that the tendencies of the narcissistic character in terms of self-interpretation, interpersonal re uh, relationality are called for or um, preconditioned in the context of neoliberal value and, and ideal. So most notably, these critics identify neoliberal value narratives that espouse as we mentioned before, a highly atomized, individually accountable, responsible, competitively capable existence as ideal. With failures of self-actualization, they belong to the individual. They're, these are individual failures, um, not preconditioned, uh, or at least the thinking is not preconditioned by the structures and the systems um, that hold a lot of the power, in, in, in my view. So pointing to emergent features at the heart of the neoliberal narcissist, Cushman, Hagen, and Leighton, what do they trace at the core of the, the narcissistic character or the neoliberal character is a transient sense of self, highly dependent upon external meaning systems. So instead of striving to change or alter extant social, political, and economic relations into what we might think of as more hospitable, um, the neoliberal subject, their primary concern or the, the narcissistic subject's primary concern is eschewing dependency, vulnerability, and collective action as as weakness, as uh, um, these are things I should be able to rise above. So for Hoggett, contemporary methodology that best operates to offer a highly affirming sense of self for that atomistic, outward-looking self-actualizer, at least in terms of you know what we're thinking of as um, corporate knowledge workers, which is sort of the realm of boundary management theory. Um, the epistemology here is performativity. So central to this idea of perform performativity is harmonizing the knowledge worker's skills and motives with system efficiency. There's a nefariousness here. Um, we're trying to meld these things, even though they might not feel great. So what Hoggett calls attention to is, while um, we might think of as like Tayloristic modes of observation, measurement, and control that were actually suited to the industrial factory worker. You know, when you think of things like performance demands, production of goods, satisfaction of goals, um, it's not so easy when it comes to the corporate worker. It's a little bit trickier. How do we measure these things? And, you know, to the end of uh, neoliberal subjectivity, we need them measured because this is how we measure, this is how we affirm ourselves. This is how we reify ourselves relative to some external meaning system. So whereas tangible production of a widget dictated whether or not a performance goal had been achieved in an industrial setting, the assessment of one success relative to whether or not a concept has been achieved for the neoliberal knowledge worker is a lot more difficult. So within performativity, Hoggett actually deconstructs how multifaceted modes of performance evaluation, right, like those that might function to evaluate processes um, and outputs actually via procedural, quantitative, and multi-tiered appraisers by managers and peers, which is all the more intangible. Um, performativity actually 
can be intoxicating because it brings these things down to the world. It makes them a little more tangible, even though we're really just imposing these things via construct. Um, but that's still very affirming because we're looking to an external system. Like, you need to tell me who to be and how I'm good. So what Ho Hoggett ultimately argues is that it's an effective assurance of external, public, quantifiable workplace goals that self garners validation relative, as I mentioned, to, to, to more tangible standards, um, such that a sense of progress toward actualization and thus reification of, of me can be believed, uh, if only temporarily, through what we might think of as in line with Foucault's governmentality in a, a very robust program of self-monitoring. Moving on to slide 13. So the question becomes, uh, what actually becomes of failing self-states that aren't reified in keeping with neoliberal society's ideals and what we might think of as uh, an adjoining workplace regimen uh, of quantifying productivity. So here we'll mention Foucault again here. So relying upon the Foucaultian concept of governmentality or what Foucaultians frame as a systematic program of internalization that preconditions and structures all experience via internalized um, social standards against which a pre-reflective schema of self-surveillance in comparison unfolds. Leighton, she argues that self-states failing to satisfy these externally reifying standards in the schema of self-actualization, you know, just because we don't like them doesn't mean that they, they go away as much as we would like them to. So Leighton in her, um, you know, integrating what we think of as like a critical relational psychoanalytic perspective actually illuminates the emergent defensive constellation associated with neoliberal subjectivity. So how is it, in Leighton's estimation, from a psychoanalytic perspective, how is it that we keep these bad me and not me self-states at bay? What is the defensive constellation and thus the uh, psychodynamic underpinnings that allow us to do this thing in order to minimize anxiety? So she explains that undesirable self-states running counter to the program of neoliberalism, again, what are the ones that run counter to the program of neo, ne, neoliberalism? It's self-states that actually make us feel vulnerable and, and independent in ways that we can't ignore. So what Leighton says is those are disavowed, split off, dissociated, and projected onto the other to quell my anxiety by casting them as weak, them as ineffectual, them as uh, dependent. And she actually talks about how this plays out in our politics, which is very, very interesting. Um, but as we, as we well know, disowned yet ever-present self-states are just that they're ever-present and they, they they don't go away they inform our our uh, relationality so this takes a couple of you know these dynamics take a couple of manifestations in Leighton's estimation so she what she deems damaging and damaged articulations of autonomy and dependency within the intrapsychic dynamics of neoliberal subjectivity she says these are really parallel with narcissistic character uh, structures and, and relationality. And so what she says is really hallmark of the narcissistic character and really what lie at the root of, of this defensive structure, what this character demands in terms of what it keeps at bay in terms of anxiety, are what Leighton calls grotesque manifestations of and oscillations between autonomy. And so when we're at that end of the spectrum, we oscillate to uh, self-serving grandiosity that really devalues and objectifies the other and pushes aside, um, it bastardizes dependence. So there is a dependence in that I need to be reified by the other, but I'm dominating the other. And at the other end of that spectrum is what we would think of as more like self-deprecating subservience to an idealization of the other at the other extreme. But these dynamics, as Leighton argues, they operate relative to shame, right? Shame associated with perceived failures in meeting neoliberal benchmarks um, for failing to, you know, having to be bound by context and authentically emergent emotions, like, so that I'm not, it shows me that I'm not independently capable uh, maximally all the time. So for Leighton, experiences of shame in neoliberal society emerge relative to, and they vary also depending on one's intersectional positioning. Right, such that economic, political, and cultural inequalities loom with respect to our experiences of shame. Our shame isn't the same based on where we're positioned uh, intersectionally. So Leighton, and I think this, uh, I, I pulled this piece in particular, you could go on for this for uh, a while, 
Um, but I think as it's relevant to boundary management theory, Leighton shares clinical experiences of people in middle and upper class, uh, upper and middle class people in the United States. And she says that these people, in her experience, are always engaged in comparison with peers, such that even the idea of, in quotes, having downtime has become shameful in contemporary life when one could otherwise be self-actualizing or serving another's meaning system that would prove reifying, if we want to think of it in those terms. Um, Hoggett uh, thinks the same in terms of a shade of shame avoidant dynamic. So what do we arrive at? This is a highly fragmented self-system. It's splitting, it's disavowing, dissociating, projecting self-states that aren't up to the task conceivably uh, based on cultural values of garnering agreement with the other in authority's meaning system. And so demand of the other, what we experience is that authoritarian demand, it negates my capacity for ambivalence and flexibility uh, of, of, of which of my self-states are capable of showing up here now. For me, this sounds a lot like the, the segmenter. So moving on to slide 14 here, again, checking in on the time here. So Leighton and Shaw, respectively, they discuss the origins of the narcissistic character, and we actually looked at developmental relationships. So this is what we talk about in the psychodynamics. So yes, the values are imbued socioculturally, but these things play out in a very fundamental relationship. Um, one, as we'll see here, and here's a highly disparate power imbalance, not unlike the one that perhaps the segmenter experiences relative to uh, larger systems and their values and, and those of the uh, organizational workplace and the values inherent there. So Leighton and Shaw, again, this is slide 14, discuss the origins of the pathologically narcissistic character, which manifest in terms of polarized responsiveness, right? The grandiosity versus the self-deprecation to the perception of my being vulnerable and dependent. How do I respond to this? Well, I respond to it in a way that minimizes my anxiety. So while acknowledging pathological narcissism, and for me this is interesting, as the emergent social character and structure of subjectivity relative to neoliberalism's value program. People like Hoggett, uh, Philip Bromberg, um, they, they explain that in, in their estimation, and I think there's something to this, is that the pathologically narcissistic character, it's not simply a situated phenomenon within neoliberal society and its values, but neoliberalism does provide a hell of a platform um, because of the uh, um, always implicit, highly imbalanced relational processes that would ignore mutual subjectivity and need. So um, these authors, people like Bromberg, Shaw, et cetera, and Shaw in particular, rooted in uh, child caregiver attachment data, they say the roots of pathologically narcissistic character in relationships shows up in relationships that inhere a highly disparate power imbalance. And one that I would argue is kept implicit, right? Like we can't even raise the question. Why would we even raise the question? Because you're supposed to be independent, right? So for these, for these analysts, and, I, and all of them are psychoanalysts, it's um, it's in the failure to recognize another as a center of differentiated subjectivity and instead an object or vehicle for having one's own needs met unilaterally that shame emerges for the disempowered other. So we're talking about a highly shame avoidant uh, psychodynamic uh, intrapsychic structure. And Leighton explains that when the power disadvantaged partner fails to satisfy its dyadic, more powerful partner's needs and fools and actually dares to have its own situated authentic need, the wrath suffered by the power disadvantaged partner relative to its need-based deviation um, renders this need, which was once viable, right, until it was met oppositionally, um, it renders it a non-viable, deficient, and, and, and shameful modality relative to the empowered party's emergent standard. Um, in our earliest cases, that would be framed in terms of the caregiver. Okay, slide 15. So what this process of relational imbalance ultimately amounts to, in my understanding, is that the disempowered party's highly undifferentiated sense of self, whereby one is unable to gain a modicum of self-worth, absent the manipulative abstraction of extreme forms of reifying. Um, so how, I'm getting a little tongue-tied here, but 
um, what we're saying is that it's always depending upon the other and how we're seen relative to that power system um, will oscillate in what uh, we could be uh, grandiose, we could be self-deprecating, um, and it really depends on our experience of these uh, highly power and balanced relationships that sort of imbues this way of being. So actually pointing to the work of Ernest Becker, um, Philip Bromberg uh, captures, you know, for me, and, and I, I would say for Leighton and Hoggett as well, a central feature of the pathological narcissist needs for extreme forms of validation and self-reifying agreement from the other. Uh, actually, Bromberg writes, individuals for whom interpersonal rules are rigidly fused with a particular concrete object representation bring to the analytic situation a core representation of self which is fused equally concretely to the same interpersonal unit, which is interesting to think about, and I think it's uh, really echoes a lot of, of what uh, of what Leighton and Shaw are discussing. Okay, slide 16. So we talk about the dynamics that emerge in the grandiose, manipulative uh, end of the spectrum for the narcissistic character, and we've also talked about sort of the submissive, self-deprecating, Again, all within the, uh, the guise of establishing um, agreement in terms of a meaning system. It doesn't matter whether or not I'm the powerful or the, or the, um, or the weak party or the subservient party. Um, I just need that agreement more than anything, and I'm willing to forego more authentic modes of relationality. So, um, like Leighton and Hoggett, Shaw identifies two relational manifestations that emerge relative to unidirectional sadomasochistic models of relationality in, in what Rosenfeld has actually labeled the thick and the thin-skinned narcissist, right? Um, thick being more grandiose, thin being more uh, subservient and, and uh, dominated as opposed to dominating. So what we can see is a thread common between these modes of relating is central to both of these formulations is the narcissist's dependence upon others for establishing and maintaining a sense of self via what we might think of as wholesale agreement, whether that be as controlling subject or subservient object. Okay, moving on to slide 17. Shaw identifies relationships of damaging non-recognition as responsible for imbuing patterns of narcissistic relationality. And again, points to child caregiver dynamics where the child's needs are always already subordinated to the caregiver's needs, right? Um, and he explains these dynamics of non-recognition, and he says they're represented by an abuse of the child-caregiver power imbalance and are rooted in caregivers' unconscious spite and resentment relative to their own caregivers' failures of recognition. So I believe it was on the last slide that we sort of hinted at uh, an intergenerational component um, whereby the one who was stepped on before um, feels the need to, uh, you know, my needs were not met in this same context, so... There's an element of spite there, and I'm going to have my needs met now because I have this power. I have this uh, relational imbalance that um, that I need to uh, seem you know to, to self-reify. So yeah, to this point, Shaw actually takes really gives you a little bit of empathy, but he takes great care to highlight narcissistically traumatizing caregivers' own non-recognizing child caregiver child caregiver relationships, where their own care and attention were subordinated. Right. So within this uh, dependence-averse meaning system, dependence is inherently harmful. It's indicative of weakness and as such worthy of shame and guilt insofar as the child who is really cast as the only party who demonstrates need and dependence uh, ought to feel shame and guilt for failing to live up to their, their duty of non-dependency and, and for foisting uh, what I've framed as sort of all-too-human needs onto their caregivers, which creates... Uh, um, which plays into the power imbalance. Okay. So, we've talked about who this I could be, the, psych the, the psychodynamics that percolate beneath, that sort of dictate who this I can be and actually is in certain power imbalance situations. So the question for me becomes, and I think this relates back to, uh, to the idea of emotional distress and limiting emotional distress and preference pairing is what is this emotional distress, right? What's the structure of it? Um, 
phenomenologically like what are what are we experiencing what what is at the segment what's at the root of the segment there's pain and suffering so when when an i experiences itself as an i who i can't be here when we think about the preference enactment divide okay so that was slide 18 moving on to slide 19 going back to Hagen and Leighton so both ground processes of narcissistic relationality and, and, and narcissistic character in a psychology of shame avoidance right and Hagen even suggests that neoliberal sociocultural moorings as value-oriented preconditions for ways of being have actually shifted what maybe was conceived uh, through Freud as a guilt avoidant central tendency to what's now under our neoliberal society a shame avoidant tendency. So exploring central features of shame relative to neoliberal subjects situated patterns of self-interpretation, Hagen actually compares and contrasts the dynamics of shame experiences with the dynamics of guilt experiences. So tracing that structure, he characterizes both guilt and shame as uh, associated with self-criticism relative to the work of what he frames as some kind of internal judge. But the difference being, while shame congeals around a sense of inadequacy and deficiency in the perception of having failed um, an internalized ideal value or standard, he characterizes guilt as more a moral matter of one's own conscience, wrought by what he would say is a more mature psychic structure in the superego for having failed someone else. So it's not that I'm an agented, it's not that I'm, um, you know, whereas for shame, it's a matter of agency, it's a matter of failing and autonomy, it's not living up to some standard. I'm, I don't experience myself as potent in the world. But what he's saying is, where guilt is, is uh, where guilt comes into play is, I do experience myself as potent, I just failed someone else, right? I failed someone else. Um, I could have helped them, I didn't basically is what Hoggett's saying is the sense behind that. So in this formulation, as I alluded to here a moment ago, shame emerges relative to one sense of having failed to meet an internalized standard. Um, and it's relative to the supremacy granted this internal meaning system, right? This internalized once external meaning system uh, that the other does or doesn't believe themselves to be adequately agentive in an adequately agentive member of the community, right? So. Um, and, and what's expected in this framework is rejection, abandonment, um, and that's really the fantasized penalty. Okay, so slide 20. With respect to guilt, however, again in Hoggett's estimation, where one has a strong sense of having failed another, some have argued that there is an implicit sense that one must see themselves as sufficiently capable, efficient, and agentive to even potentially imagine of taking responsibility for and affecting a different outcome. So for uh, psychologists like Maselli and Castle Frankie, the primary difference for them between shame and guilt is whether a person understands the person, the perceiver understands and experiences a transgression at the perceived lack of power to meet standards, whereas guilt implies I have perceived power um, but it was a willingness to be harmful that, that ultimately violates the standards of the normal self. So as such, it's ultimately one's recognition uh, of capability for achieving a standard or a sense of fecklessness or deficiency relative uh, to an ideal that separates the two. Again, one's experiencing guilt, there is a felt sense of efficacy, whereas the one experiencing shame is probably more apt to see a situation like this in terms of me failing to meet some sort of societal standard. Um, I'm an agent too. And ultimately, it's in, it's in one's developing sense of agency and efficiency in the world that, yeah, to my point, can even begin to consider the potential for behavior to have harmful implications, such that a moral basis for self-evaluation relative to one's standards becomes even a possibility. Okay, slide 21. So like Maselli and Castle Frankie, Hoggett, says so something similar, right? When he frames shame's experience in terms of an impotence, right? In quotes, and he quotes that in impotence. So for him, guilt experiences also require a sufficient sense of potency to ground one's sense of having responsibility for one's experiences of interpersonal suffering. Right? So to draw this even, uh, uh, to deepen this, right? Hoggett talks about, introduces the idea of resentment, right? 
Um, so he traces the affective phenomenon of resentment from a psychoanalytic perspective and positions it as in dialogue with shame in one's shame-linked feelings of, of righteous anger and resentment. So flip sides of the coin are shame, but what underlies shame and what's uh, the uh, undercurrent of shame is, is a sense of anger and resentment. And Hage characterizes these feelings of anger and resentment as stemming from, stemming from one's sense of unfairly having to suffer the injustice of a narcissistic engagement at the hands of an all-powerful giver, all-powerful caregiver, and also being told they have to take responsibility for contouring their own meaning system despite feeling ill-equipped to do so. Apologies, a, uh, you, you might hear a barking dog in the background. I apologize for that. So we'll move on to slide 22 here, keeping, keeping time in mind. So Hockett ultimately traces this idea of resentment to the idea of a uh, nursing a grievance, right? So Hockett encapsulates the experience of being aggrieved and nursing a grievance as the nexus of one's overarching sense of unjust injury in the face of robust past power imbalance, a sense of pervasive impotence and deficiency in terms of one's ability to co-construct an authentic meaning system relative to this robust past power imbalance, and ultimately the eschewal of responsibility and thus eschewal of guilt for moving beyond the original injury, right? So this grievance understandably emerges relative to unempathic engagement with those who originally failed to recognize and integrate the aggrieved once emerging sense of potency, agency, and efficacy in, in a manner that actually reflected the aggrieved sense itself. Moving on to slide 23 here. So this raises the other question that I talked about in terms of overdetermining. I think we've spoken to this point to the eye, its psychodynamics and so forth, but what are the external features that overdetermine one's experience of emotional distress, namely the segmenter, right? So um, what socio-culturally enacted values and value enacting structures reinforce who I can and can't be here to ultimately illuminate and give us the potential to deconstruct the eyes felt experience of vulnerable relational inter interdependence beyond or uh, in spite of the explicit neoliberal narrative of atomism, boundless instrumentality and individual responsibility. But um, before stepping into that discussion of uh, systemic and institutional contributions to the segmenter's emotional distress, I do wanna take a second to frame resentment as what I sort of feel is the prevailing aspect within the neoliberal narcissistically organized segment or self-experience, right? So for me, in so many words, the sentiment around resentment is as follows. So you or someone like you previously opted to not recognize my idiosyncratic, situated, authentic needs and efforts towards agency as efficacious relative to your own rigid definition of valid needs and agency. Yet now you expect me and saddle me with the responsibility of choosing or constructing single-handedly a meaning system that requires not only my sense of potency and agency, but must also integrate your needs in addition to mine. So you've negated and may still negate both my authentic sense of agency and have also failed to recognize my needs once before. And now you're guilting me if I feel if I fail to fulfill the above vision, which requires an authentic sense of agency and also a level of my graciousness, of, of forgiveness. So as such, I'm kind of now damned if I do and damned if I don't. So. If I accept your meaning system and needs at all, it feels to me as though I'm saying you were right despite my suffering and this early misrecognition of situatedness. However, if I reject your meaning system and needs altogether, I have no way at all of having my needs recognized or my agency or my potency and, and therefore don't really have a sense of self in the world. And for me, this is the experience you know, based on my review of the literature that it's starting to feel like the segmenter is experiencing. So in the section to come here, I'm really trying to illuminate external grounds that set up values of independence, autonomy, instrumentality, and personal responsibility, and also illuminate the external grounds, conditions that contemporaneously make these things ring false and over-determine the segmenter's emotional distress, right? Okay. Slide 24. 
So stepping into the external, right? Like what's, what is it that's positioned as good? Uh, what's positioned as ideal in the neoliberal state? So slide 24. So as you see here, Karin Battle highlight uh, neoliberal society's demands for modes of being that safeguard and perpetuate the free market. Like that's, uh, anything we do is in service of that purpose. And the idea of per, uh, like pervasive deregulation and actually setting aside interdependence because that undermines the free market. So neoliberal morality positions individual freedom, personal responsibility, and competition as good as good for the virtuous person and against these ideals what we think of as like any demonstration of vulnerability is a matter of individual choice right like one is willfully um, adhering to a less true value system or they're unable to keep up with neoliberal standards of duty and decency so rather than rather than acknowledging a level of inter interdependence which we're all kind of feeling um, that suggests the potential benefits of reassigning responsibility vulnerability is weakness Okay, slide 25. So the neoliberal workplace, not unlike this, also structures itself and embodies overarching neoliberal values, not surprisingly, as we might think in governmentality. So there's a number of ways to do this in the, uh, the neoliberal framework and the neoliberal workplace takes up an ontology and epistemology and an ethics that basically reinforce these ideas, these central ideas of um, instrumentality, individual uh, responsibility, and so forth. Basically the ideas of a self-interested individualism and if you're failing in some way it falls on you. It really has nothing to do with um, with how the uh, organization operates. So Fleetwood interestingly raises the question of like why now? Right? Why, why are all of a sudden we having this conversation about flexible work practices? And this he wrote this pre-COVID um, but the way he frames this is that Essentially, flexible work practices prior uh, could be framed in negative ways, right? Like people, employees had experiences of flexible work practices, which remote working would certainly be, um, as impacting them negatively. But what happens now in the modern discourse is that, oh, we've forgotten the negative impact or even neutral impact of flexible work practices. It's all good at this point in time. That's how it's framed. So... Fleetwood sees this as a transfer of responsibility. And you know, as, as I've written here, it's a quiet shift, a smoke screen that shifts responsibility from the state or the organization to the individual. And for Fleetwood, there's something wrong with this. And I, I, I would agree with that. Okay. Slide 27. So what we see here is like there consistently emerges evidence of the rise of flexible work practices, particularly in the form of remote working, um, largely in, in line with, with COVID, like largely uh, in terms of the shift that's kind of had to be made on, on some grounds in terms of COVID. But what's interesting is like, so framed within the confines of knowledge work, Chowdhury notes pros for businesses in terms of there are good things happening and flexible remote practices are largely good for business, right? So there's reduction or elimination of real estate costs, mitigating immigration issues associated with global talent, uh, and enjoying productivity gains. And we can see here, um, Chowdhury points to another study that identifies what these productivity gains look like, right? And we've seen the same thing um, in a current article that, yeah, productivity is, is raising largely due um, to people's not having to commute, and, and other items as well. But cons around this situation are really only framed from an organizational standpoint. Burnout's mentioned by Chowdhury, but mentioned only in so far as it undercuts productivity. Slide 28. Like I said, so while Chowdhury briefly references, briefly references burnout, it's not addressed as a downside associated with longer hours while working from home, but as a managerial concern, right? It's an impediment to productivity. However, there's an article in the Monitor on Psychology on future of remote work that raises the following concerns that are largely in line uh, with my own. So it says, along with social isolation, the clouding of work family boundaries is a significant challenge for remote employees. Teleworkers operating from 
A home office lack physical and psychological separation, i.e. boundaries, between these two domains that exist in a traditional office setting, says Golden. Uh, this is an industrial organizational psychologist. So on the one hand, family and social obligations can easily bleed over into work hours, but more often, studies show that teleworkers' professional obligations tend to extend beyond the traditional workday. So what can we do with a lot of this stuff? You know, we've talked about how Leighton um, talked about the uh, um, emotional distress and the shape, the affective shape of our uh, emotional distress relative to a narcissistic power imbalance emotional dynamic. But let's start to see how these things are overdetermined, as I mentioned before. So we can extrapolate to the sociocultural level and political philosophers like Bauman and Foster have commented on the discrepancy between explicit narratives around neoliberal existence, right, and its ontological individualism, unfettered freedom and choice, and altruistic corporate practices that are motivated uh, by that which is framed as an interest of the employees, and what actually occurs in felt experience that actually start to contradict these narratives um, threadbare masking potential. And we can think about things like managerialism, precarization, and we won't spend a ton of time on this, uh, but I do at least want to call attention on slide 30 to what we can think of in terms of what is managerialism and how it operates in order to provide a masking function, right? So Foster positions the rise of managerialism, and he defines it as, as, as following. So it's basically a style of governance whereby individuals' emotions, needs, and desires for self-fulfillment are harmonized as framed in alignment with and operationalized in service of prevailing societal and institutional goals. He frames this in terms of the therapeutic ethos and talks about how psychology, or at least mainstream psychology, has had a hand in uh, uh, framing this as good, right? Like what's good for the organization. So um, I think really the take home in terms of managerialism is that so Foster points to work to highlight the impact of the therapeutic ethos and it's contemporaneously undermining shared cultural meaning and morality that transcends, transcends individual need while prioritizing the individual's emotional needs and facilitating the emergence of, emergence of a true self as the ultimate ethical barometer. To this end, Lash has also identified the weakening of collective meanings as having an iatrogenic consequence. Rather than freeing individuals to become whatever they felt themselves to be idiosyncratically, sounds a little bit like the uh, thick-skinned narcissist, the absence of shared meaning left a hole that provoked feelings of fundamental insecurity and anxiety. So instead of the pervasively grandiose narcissistic subject determined to self-actualize in their own image, right, the ubermensch, um, what Foster tells us is that subjectivity has actually taken another shape in keeping with an emotional style characterized by techniques of self-monitoring and management in service of self-realization. So we gambled for the narcissist. Narcissism would have been okay if we got the grandiose narcissist. But what they found is humans are actually, and particularly human beings situated in uh, power imbalanced relationships, actually turn out to be more like the thin-skinned narcissist. So um, from, the, from the perspective of neoliberalism, we sort of gambled and lost in that respect. So how does this manifest in the workplace? There's a subordination, right? In imposing tasks and standard it's substituted by a current of self-management and conformity motivated by individual employees' needs and desires to live up to the ideals of therapeutic culture and being an agreeable, emotionally well-managed empath to bolster their earning potential and create more robust potentials to self-actualize. Turning to precarization, and that is slide 31. So we turn to the work of Bauman here, and he illuminates the centrality of uncertainty to modern constructs of power. And he explains that power isn't really derived from forms of domination that limit choice and impose will, but actually by creating more options, right? And, and, and framing it as your responsibility, right? So creating a dizzying array of choices under highly precarious positions, it makes the capacity to choose, decide, and act as it, it becomes head spinning. So we choose the thing that is most reifying, but what there's actually very, very few choices within the mix because very, uh, very few choices will actually prove 
more self-reifying relative to an external meaning standard, which is important for neoliberal subjectivity. Okay, so shifting gears here and actually turning to the integration side as like aspirational subjectivity. So um, pointing out the work of Nancy McWilliams, which has informed my psychodynamic practice quite a bit, at least in a clinical sense. So Nancy McWilliams actually characterizes difficulty preserving self as in dialogue with difficulty registering self and other as a differentiated psychic entity. So flowing therefrom, she identifies psychotic experience as in hearing difficulties in differentiating between abstracted conceptual divisions of experience in terms of determining whether uh, something is occurring internally or externally. So I, in my estimation, what McWilliams is ultimately pointing to is um, the processes of schizophrenia and the, the, the more psychotic processes do involve um, a severe undifferentiatedness, right? Like we're highly undifferentiated and um, insofar as the only way we can actually reduce anxiety is to demonstrate an omnipotent control and kind of rise above context, which I think is, you know, humanistic psychologist is something that is pretty antithetical to, 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 to the heart of what we to the heart of our values and what it is we practice. Slide 33. So turning to a model offered by Sass and Parnas in the Ipsaity disturbance model, um, it's not uh, counter to, to, to McWilliams' notion. So they actually focus on schizophrenia as a symptom cluster along the continuum of psych psychotic spectrum disorders that also offers a highly disturbed sense of self um, as central to schizophrenic experience, right, in processes. So more fundamental um, than a sense of continuity, identity, or even self-continuity, it's aity disturbance is such that it's without a centering subject or perspective, which is a lot like what Leighton had to say um, around uh, narcissistic pro uh, processes as well. So on the one hand, we're asking the segmenter to disavow or... Um, Better yet, you could just ignore context altogether, right? And that, that uh, you can just disturb your sense of self relative to context altogether, very much in the sense of like ignoring a, a docile formulated model of, uh, of experience of self. So winding down here, um, turning to slide 34. You know, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but we've talked about how the segmenter in accommodation becomes a um, a disavowing uh, machine, lopping off parts of selves. It's like you'd be better off if you weren't doing this. Um, so it, we frame the integrator as aspirational, so someone who can ignore context, which would be better yet. But what we're understanding is both of these are self-undermining, right, from a psychoanalytic perspective, in that Contemporary psychoanalysis, and I would argue even more orthodox or traditional psychoanalysis, would frame self-differentiation as uh, as healthy as um, as the paradigm for for what we would consider health. And as such, it kind of positions either both ends of the continuum as uh, as pathological for me. Um, okay, so we'll wind down here. In closing, so boundary management theory is a theory of organizational psychology that acknowledges employees flip, and this is slide 35, excuse me. Boundary management theory is a theory of organizational psychology, as you see here, um, that acknowledges employees' flexibility or rigidity in it having varied role identities across context. The balance of theorists in, in boundary management theory appear to be most interested in exploring employees' ability or lack thereof to inhabit role identities or work role identities in non-work context. So in other words, as I pointed throughout, their interest lies in the permeability and flexibility of boundaries that employees draw pre-reflexively between work and non-work context. And they ultimately ask of employees, what's your capability for inhabiting a work role in a non-work context? Of course, the dynamic flip side of this question is, what is one's capacity for inhabiting experience a non-work role in this context? So, as I mentioned before, they ask that question of who can I be here? But there's no deconstruction and there's really no consideration of, or very little consideration for how um, 
our larger structures, the workplace, society, and the associated norms and values precondition what our choices are, right? Or how we can even address it. So boundary management studies have importantly, to this end, identified an emergent phenomenon where employees with a preference for segmentation, that's again, keeping work and non-work roles separate and apart, they experience emotional exhaustion when they perceive a work demand, right? So again, where, where these theorists fall short, I believe is, um, not expressing an interest in or, or maybe ignoring in some cases how do employees tolerate seeing themselves as not inhabiting a work role identity when a context not traditionally expected to be work context becomes a work context and again what are the dynamics of of that emotional distress so and what appears to be an overarching moral ethical dimension to boundary management theory boundary management theorists advocate for pairing and matching uh, to accommodate a segmentation preference, to mitigate emergent employees' emotional distress. All the while, there are BMT theorists that acknowledge that the reality of accommodation segment, accommodating segmentation is fading with the integration framed, in some cases explicitly, as a, a prevailing mode of employment with segmentation vanishing as, as a possibility of employment. So as such, BMT does not question emergent value narratives that kind of rose with them, except in very limited circumstances. Um, but the reflective, conscious, formulated narrative is that segmentation is paradoxically viable, but disappearing. On the other hand, integration is seen and felt by the segmenter as increasingly occupying a dominant, prevailing, necessary space within the contemporary uh, employment environment. So herein, um, relying upon an alternate in interpretive lens, informed by relational psychoanalysis and postmodern and critical philosophy, it becomes possible to explore, deconstruct, and situate employees' pre-reflexive, emotionally uh, charged self-interpretations in terms of competing value appraisals at the heart of the phenomenon. So within this model, um, the segmenter's affective interpretation uh, is exemplary of conflicts between culturally sanctioned and unsanctioned self-states at the intersection of narcissistic neoliberal subjectivity particularly given the role of work as central to contemporary self-actualization. So from a psychoanalytic perspective, we might imagine the narcissistically constellated segmenter as being encouraged by BMT pairing to engage in self-undermining. Uh, very primitive defensive dissociation and splitting, or defensiveness, uh, primitive defensism dissociating, splitting, and projection, hallmark of narcissistic uh, character. Or on the flip side, we might think of the integrator, who's the ideal neoliberal employee nowadays, as uh, having essentially to engage psychotic processes where we disavow a teleological sense of self um, in being able to rise above context, again, sort of in the, the very uh, being in the world sense of docile, well, negating the world portion and just sort of uh, imminently being uh, whoever, whoever we're being asked to be by our employer. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I've included my email address if anybody wants to send any comments and uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity and thanks again for your time. Bye.